In May of 1897, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld and a few of his associates gathered in his Berlin apartment. This day marked the first successful creation of an organization advocating LGBT rights. Hirschfeld would go on to become the pivotal leader of a movement whose legacy has only recently begun to reemerge. <laughs> Magnus Hirschfeld was born to a large Jewish family on May 14, 1868, in the Pomeranian town of Kohlberg in what was then Prussia. He studied medicine at university and earned his MD in 1892. Several years later, one of Hirschfeld's patients committed suicide because of his homosexuality. In the suicide note, the young soldier challenged Hirschfeld to inform the public about how numerous gay men shared his fate and to teach people to be more open-minded. Shortly after this, Hirschfeld moved to Charlottenburg in Berlin. It was there that he founded the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, or SHC, probably the first organization campaigning for LGBT rights. A previous attempt to form such an organized movement was spearheaded by Karl Heinrich Ulrichs in the 1860s. His campaign to repeal the contemporaneous sodomy statute might have succeeded if not for the extremely publicized trial of a gay man accused of serial rape and murder. Because of this and other contributing factors, an anti-sodomy law was included in the 1871 penal code of the newly founded German Empire. It was called Paragraph 175. I, I really think that um, uh, Hirschfeld himself, in some ways, was a creation of Berlin. I mean, Hirschfeld needed Berlin, and uh, uh, the Scientific Humanitarian Committee needed Berlin. Between 1871 and 1900, Berlin's population doubled, and it developed from a backwards provincial town to a progressive metropolis and the capital of an empire. Hand in hand with this rapid modernization came an increase in Berlin's gay subculture. Hirschfeld estimated that there were 15 gay and lesbian bars in 1904, a number which more than doubled within the next decade. Though Berlin's police commissioner originally enforced paragraph 175 very harshly, he eventually adopted an attitude of tolerance and instead prosecuted the rampant blackmail of gay men. So Hirschfeld was actually very intentionally including police in his planning and in his organization of the first homosexual rights group. The main task of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee was campaigning for the repeal of paragraph 175. From 1897 through the 1920s, the SHC repeatedly presented petitions for its repeal to the Reichstag, which were all struck down. They almost succeeded in 1929 and were only stopped by the dissolution of the parliament. The motto of the SHC, through science to justice, sums up Hirschfeld's work perfectly. He put forward the idea of sexual intermediacy, proposing that all human characteristics, physical and psychological, occur on a spectrum between masculine and feminine. Hirschfeld also attempted to prove that homosexuality is inborn and natural, using genetics and later endocrinology, the latter of which led to his involvement in a series of inhumane experiments that were contradictory to his own work. They involved transplanting testes to determine whether this could quote-unquote cure gay men. Hirschfeld's mixing of science and political activism earned him many critics over his lifetime. Scientists believe that his findings were not objective or even capable of being so. Certain members of the gay community, such as Adolf Brandt, the founder of the first gay journal in the world, believe that Hirschfeld's theories overemphasize the alleged effeminacy of gay men. Brandt split from the Scientific Humanitarian Committee and founded the Community of the Special, Berlin's second gay rights organization, in 1903. In 1919, in the new Weimar Republic, Hirschfeld founded the Institute for Sexual Science in a mansion on the banks of the Spree River in Berlin. The scope of the institute was much larger than that of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. It encompassed the entire field of sexology and was used for academic research and training, as well as providing medical treatment and counseling. I met Magnus Hirschfeld through a friend of mine. I found him a very sympathetic elderly gentleman. He looked rather like a walrus, but a very nice walrus. 
the Institute became a kind of social hub. It sponsored public events, balls and lectures, and expanded to include housing facilities and a museum. In 1919, Hirschfeld also wrote and appeared in the film, Different from the Others, which tells the story of a violinist who is blackmailed with threats to expose his homosexuality. 1923 marked the founding of a third gay rights organization in Berlin, the Human Rights League, headed by Friedrich Ratzuweit, while Hirschfeld's movement appealed to educated people with leftist leanings, and Brand's community of the special became affiliated with the fledgling Nazi party. Ratzuweit's Human Rights League had a more populist appeal. The last project Hirschfeld ever founded was the World League for Sexual Reform in 1926. It held prominent conventions in Copenhagen, London, Vienna, and Brno, Czechoslovakia in the following years. In November of 1930, Hirschfeld departed on a world tour, leaving his longtime lover Karl Giese in Berlin. He traveled to the United States for several months, but decided not to return directly to Germany, instead traveling on to Asia. In Shanghai, Hirschfeld met Li Xiotong, a medical student who accompanied him for the rest of his journey which included Indonesia, India, Egypt, and Palestine. By April of 1933, the growing Nazi authority in Germany led Hirschfeld to write, I have resigned myself to the idea that I shall never see Germany, my homeland again, though it pains me greatly. His exile was sealed on May 6, 1933, when Nazi students plundered the Institute for Sexual Science. Several days later, they burned many of its books and records at the Opernplatz. To be sometimes treated with official respect, sometimes threatened with death, to be alternately praised and lampooned by the press, to be helped by those who would later lose their nerve and betray him, such was his nobly insecure position. The anti-Semitism that had dogged Hirschfeld his entire life only intensified at this point, and the Nazis vilified him as a gay Jewish socialist. Magnus Hirschfeld died on May 14, 1935, in Nice, France, on his 67th birthday. With Hitler's rise to power came a crackdown on Germany's LGBT community. The culture that had emerged in the late 19th century and flourished in the liberal atmosphere of Weimar Germany was crushed in a few short years. An estimated 100,000 men were arrested under the more draconian version of paragraph 175 enacted during the Third Reich. Between 5,000 and 15,000 of these men perished in concentration camps. Während ich da war, wurden alle Homosexuellen abtransportiert nach Mauthausen und sind fast alle. After several failed attempts of reorganization in the 1950s, Hirschfeld's work had fallen into almost complete obscurity. It is mentioned briefly in Alfred Kinsey's Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. However, Kinsey suggests that Hirschfeld's scientific integrity was compromised by his own homosexuality. From the 1960s onwards, Hirschfeld began to be gradually rediscovered throughout the world. What I sort of felt was that America was bringing back what was in hibernation from the time of Hitler until the 1960s. The Magnus Hirschfeld Society was founded in 1982. We started to dig up things from, uh, from the dust, so we may have known again. Paragraph 175 remained part of the German Penal Code in several variations until 1994, when it was finally repealed, almost 60 years after Hirschfeld's death. In 2011, the Magnus Hirschfeld Federal Foundation was created. It supports research and education projects to counteract discrimination against the LGBT community. Well, the legacy, legacy is uh, to go on where he uh, couldn't, not to stop struggling for equal rights for all kinds of sexual beings. And I think that is something we still have to struggle for. With the growth of lesbian and gay studies, as well as queer theory over the past few decades, more scholarship has explored the blind spots of LGBT history, including Magnus Hirschfeld. I think there's a the beginning of a Hirschfeld Renaissance, and I think it's going to continue. And I think people will discover a lot of wonderful stuff. <laughs>